If y'all are ready, we're ready. And because Ellen and I both have great imaginations, we're going to close our eyes briefly and imagine hundreds of fellow residents out there listening to us. Ready, Ellen? You bet. Okay. You first. I'm going to start off with an essay that I call Shoulda, Woulda, Coulda. And it begins with a quote from the character Andy Bernard in the closing moments of the finale of the television series, The Office. Andy says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Well, it is what it is, the world, the world situation, the situation in which we are. Everything, everything just is what it is. And it is what it is because it was what it was. We're doing what we're doing because we did what we did. And we did what we did because we did what we did before that. It's what we did all the way back to the beginning. For the present moment to be different from what it is would require the past to be different from what it was. If things could be different, they would be different. They aren't because they can't be. They are what they are. A movie put me onto this one-way roundabout track to nowhere, a bittersweet romantic comedy called La La Land. The title is clever, relating to the movie being set in Los Angeles, also known as L.A. or La. And it's a musical, and Patti Page sang Tra La La, twiddly dee dee. And La 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 is what one chants hands over ears when one wants to avoid hearing a painful message, when one wishes things had not turned out the way they did. Wishing to avoid a painful message, wishing for a different outcome, is what the final scenes of the movie illustrate. The romance is between her, an aspiring actress trying hard to get a part, any part, something that will put her on the path to a career in movies, and him, a jazz pianist, a purist who wants to open a jazz club where the music will be played as it should be to an audience who appreciates it as it should. They fall deeply in love. Their twists and turns, challenges, more disappointments than successes, until suddenly she gets her lucky break. She's offered a part in a major movie to be shot in Paris, requiring a commitment of many months. And because he has contracted to perform with a band, requiring lengthy tours and recording studio sessions, he has to stay in LA. They resist, then realize, then accept that they must separate, must go do their separate things on their separate paths, and they pledge before parting, I will always love you, and I will always love you. Now the story jumps forward five years, and we see that she has become a star, rich, married with a toddler and a nanny in a penthouse with a view, and he has the jazz club of his dreams. They've lost touch completely, apparently. She comes into his club by chance. She sees him on the stage, he sees her in the audience, and he begins to play the melody that he was playing when they first met. And I wanted it to be different. I wanted them to both succeed, but to be successful together. Because I like them both as individuals, and I like them as a couple. I felt like putting my hands over my ears, closing my eyes, and chanting la, 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 la. Things had not turned out the way I wanted them to. In response to my dissatisfaction, the director restarts their relationship, going back to the first time she hears him play. As he is leaving, she says the same eight words. And he, instead of brushing past her as before, sweeps her into a passionately shared kiss. 
From that new beginning, their life together takes them to the same successes, but always together. No problems along the way, a shared life of eternal spring, blue skies and flowers, romance always in the air. They marry, she becomes a star, he gets his jazz club, they have a baby, and together, everything and always together, they reach the joyous finale together. The happy, satisfying ending that the director knew the viewers wanted. Then the director fades the scene away from what didn't happen and comes back to what did happen, what had to happen, because he did brush by her and they didn't kiss that first time she heard him play. And everything that happened after that brought them to this moment, the only possible moment. He smiles at her, barely, and she barely smiles back. They smile across the dimly lit club as she leaves. They smile warmly and just a bit sadly at the memory of what they had. They smile because, as they promised, they still and always will love each other. It's a moment of acceptance, acceptance of the reality of how it all turned out. And in that moment, the viewer is reminded that the present can be only what it is because the past could only be what it was. Well, Phil and I have never lived in Los Angeles, but we've lived in quite a few cities. In fact, we are kind of city people at heart. But not too long ago, we discovered our inner country people when we moved to Person County, North Carolina, just um, not too far north of where we are now. But in a very rural part of the state, a very beautiful part of the state, and our neighbors had horses and cows and goats, and we had chickens and ducks and a dog. And now I'd like to share with you a little bit about our country life. The name of this essay is Ode to the Black Duck. We don't name our ducks or chickens anymore. I say we, but I'm the one who did it. And I stopped after we had to put Betty and Blanche and Esmeralda in the freezer. Those hens were in our first flock of Delaware chickens, and we used to let them out of their coop every morning to roam in the yard until evening would call them back to their roost. We got a kick out of watching this trio parade through the yard in that curious, jerky, chicken way. We admired the way that they would each go running back to the pen and jump back in the nest when it was time to lay an egg. We paid attention to their personalities and their quirks and thought of them as pets. Well, at least I did. To fill with his pragmatic approach to our small-scale farming efforts, they were always livestock. He thought it was amusing when I went to language school in Costa Rica and following the school's instructions, I took photos of my family and pets to show my host family. So I took a picture of the Galinas and introduced them by name. Don Alvaro and Doña Flor called their friends on the phone to tell them that their American student had chickens with names. Eventually, however, Betty and Blanche and Esmeralda stopped laying and Betty went a little crazy, insisting on sitting on an empty nest day after day. We wanted to get new baby chicks. The problem was that the experts say you can't put little ones in with grown birds who just see the fuzzy newcomers as lunch. So I had to let go of Betty and Blanche and Esmeralda. And though I couldn't eat a bite of the chicken salad that we took to a potluck dinner, Everyone said it was delicious. Since then, I've avoided becoming attached to poultry, trying to follow the lead of a neighbor child who had a pet rooster that she carried around and showed off at parties. When the rooster and several of his female companions were killed by stray dogs, I was really worried about Katie. But she said, not with a shrug, but with a mature grasp of reality. 
Will chickens die? I'm thinking of Katie today because last night something carried off one of our magpie ducks, a two black female that we called the black duck. Magpies are supposed to be mostly white with specific black marks on the head and back, so this one would win no prizes at a duck show. But unlike Betty, who had a problem with motherhood, abandoning eggs and then sitting on nothing, this duck was a model mom-to-be. She carefully covered her eggs with leaves and feathers, leaving them only twice a day to go hang out briefly with the other ducks eating and drinking and taking a bath with obvious pleasure, but no dawdling. We enjoyed watching and we enjoyed watching her enjoy her spa time and then hasten back to the eggs. She had made her nest in the garden between the lady peas and the asparagus, and though Phil built a small shed over her for protection from the weather, we couldn't protect her from nighttime predators. Last night, something got her. Phil thinks it was a fox. And we're both surprised and sad. Surprised because we had become complacent, thinking she was safe since she'd been on the nest for almost a month. And surprised that we're sad for this duck who had no name. Phil points out all the folk wisdom associated with poultry, as in ducks in a row. They do follow one another, often in a straight line. A sitting duck, yes, she was. And of course, don't count your chicks before they hatch. We were hoping for three or four ducklings from the seven eggs she was keeping warm. Not only does it feel wrong for such diligence to go unrewarded, but also, her loss touches the part of me that's connected to all beings. It makes me aware of a vibration that affects my energy today and makes me want to honor her with a renewed sense of compassion for all creatures and a need to pay attention. Rather melodramatically and perhaps inappropriately, and with apologies to Willie Loman's wife, I can imagine the Drake out there saying, Attention must be paid. Attention must be paid to such a one. We've retrieved her eggs and put them in an incubator, but we don't know if they're still viable. All we can do is hope and care, but not care too much. Like Katie, we have to accept the wonders and the consequences of being alive and the wisdom of non-attachment paraphrased in the simple, hard, true words of a 10-year-old, will ducks die? A variety is the spice of life, so here's about as big a change of pace as we could manage. This is an essay that, it's in its, it's in its second version, uh, I wrote I wrote the original many years ago and then realized the new and added relevance of it, uh, so rewrote it, updated it for now. It's called Toilet Paper. When I taught a class in writing personal essays, participants would ask, but what should I write about? What can I write about? And my invariable answer was, anything. Anything can be an essay topic. It's all about context, about placing your topic in a context that hooks your readers and draws them in, makes them see it as relevant to their own lives and stories. This essay may be the ultimate test of my answer because this essay is about toilet paper. It starts with a backstory, a toilet paper backstory. It begins 21 years ago, in 1999, when I watched the television film, Tuesdays with Maury. Early in the story, Maury talks about how his rapidly progressing ALS is taking away his ability to do things for himself. He sums it up in the one specific thing, the one ability that he knows he will lose, being able to wipe his own ass. 
Having to have somebody do that for him would be the ultimate concession to dependency. A few years later, we went to a retreat in Costa Rica with Ram Das, a spiritual teacher whose book, Be Here Now, we had both read and which had deeply affected us. Like Maury, Ram Das had been a strong, vital, active man, an independent man. And as a result of a recent severe stroke, Ram Das was, like Maury, totally dependent on others for everything that he needed done, including wiping his ass. In one of the meditation sessions at the retreat, the leader recounted Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching on what can be seen in a sheet of paper. The cloud that produced the rain to grow the tree from which the paper was made, the logger who felled the tree, the parents who birthed and fed him, all the interdependent entities that contributed to bringing the sheet of paper to be. The next morning, while seated on the toilet, I looked at the piece of toilet paper in my hand, and I realized that, like Thich Nhat Hanh's sheet of paper, my piece of toilet paper was the product of clouds and rain, trees, loggers, and the parents who birthed and fed the loggers. But my vision didn't stop there. The loggers used saws made of steel, and steel logging equipment loaded the logs onto trucks. The trucks drove the road over roads made of concrete, over bridges of steel. The trucks and the equipment were made of steel and plastic and glass, and they ran on rubber tires. Rubber tree tappers had collected the sap, and processing plants had made it into vulcanized rubber, and tire manufacturers had made that into tires and shipped them on boats made of steel. Miners had dug iron ore, smelters had converted ore to iron, and steel makers converted the iron to steel, and mills had converted the steel into sheets and rods, which other workers at other plants made into machinery and boats. All the equipment that moved was powered by gasoline and lubricated by oil from oil wells and refineries. And bankers made loans, and lawyers drew up contracts, and farmers raised the food that fed everybody, and doctors and nurses treated their ailments and mended their wounds, and preachers tended to their spiritual needs, while entertainers of every variety kept them amused, and teachers taught them the knowledge they needed to do their jobs. And governments provided stable societies, trade agreements, and economies that enabled workers to work and to sell what they made and buy what others made. And at some point, a truck delivered a case of toilet paper to a store, a clerk put it on the shelf, somebody from the retreat center went to the store, picked up the roll, paid the cashier and brought it back, and a housekeeper put the roll on the roller beside where I was sitting, and I tore off the piece I held in my hand. All that and more. All those people and more. All that had to be done for me by them so that I could hold that piece of toilet paper and wipe my ass and in so doing proclaim that I was still an independent person because I didn't need help carrying out the final act. I had always clung to my self-image as an independent person. I liked doing things for myself. Didn't want people doing things for me. But somehow, I didn't seem to mind that it took just about everybody in the world working hard to get a piece of toilet paper into my hand. Somehow, I didn't see that as making me dependent. Now it's 2020, and we're in lockdown because of the coronavirus pandemic. There's been panic, buying, and hoarding. And along with hand sanitizer and face masks, the greatest shortage in the marketplace marketplace is, you guessed it, toilet paper. As soon as talk began to spread about possibly being confined to home, everybody ran out and bought a couple of years supply of toilet paper. Now I would love to think that they did it so that they could meditate on human interdependence, how no woman is an island, how even the most fiercely independent person, the most dedicated back to the land survivalist, is reliant on others for almost everything produced by humans. 
But I don't think that was their concern, nor their desire. I think they wanted to guarantee that no matter what else happened, they would be able to retain that one last shred of dignity. They wanted to be sure that they could tear off a couple of squares and demonstrate their independence so that they could say them to themselves, well, at least I could still do that for myself. And now back to the country. This one is called Just Ducky. Phil says chickens and ducks are food for so many other creatures that it's a wonder that any of them survive. Of course, some of them don't. Our unnamed magpie duck, who was sitting on seven eggs, was taken off her nest. But her eggs were undisturbed. When we found her missing early one chilly spring morning, we didn't know how long the eggs had been left uncovered and getting cold. But we set up our incubator in the bathroom and moved the eggs into it. There they sat for over a week with the whirring sound of the machine reminding us of the lives we were saving, maybe. Later, when we looked at our book on raising ducks, we saw that there's a way to tell whether an egg holds a live chick. But by the time we consulted the book, it was too late. We were already hearing peeping sounds from the inside of one of the eggs. We kept running to the bathroom to peer at the egg that was slowly cracking as the little duck worked to push his way out. It took about 24 hours for him to drag his little wet body completely out of the egg and then lie there free but exhausted. Before he was strong enough to stand up, he crawled around the other eggs, pushing them gently and stopping to sleep beside one and then another. When he was awake, he was constantly chirping to the other eggs. Meanwhile, we continued reading the book, finding out that the duckling would need to stay in the incubator for four to 12 hours to dry. And he would be fine unless, oh my gosh, we had no idea he was in such danger. The book said that eggs that held chicks that had died could explode, killing them filling the incubator with putrid smelling bacteria and of course killing this poor baby. What to do? Obviously we had to get him out of there, but we couldn't do it too soon. My anxiety was building as we watched him slowly dry out and fluff up while one of the other eggs was showing signs of cracking. Phil brought in a wash tub put a box in it, along with some cedar shavings, and moved duck number one into it when he was about eight hours old. Safe at last, but not happy. He was alone and didn't like it a bit. Now the peeping turned into sharp squeaks, akin to the sounds the smoke alarm makes when the battery needs changing. Two rooms away, his shrill peeps were met by the exact same sounds coming from the incubator. Duck number two was on his way out, and he was already calling to his brother or sister, demonstrating the strong need for every creature to be part of a flock or a family. Those were happy ducklings when we were able to unite or reunite them the next morning. Thank Goodness, they had both escaped the exploding eggs. By now, 24 hours after the first one hatched, two more ducklings were on their way out. Numbers three and four arrived almost simultaneously like twins. So they had each other for company and never made the smoke alarm noise. Still, they were glad to join their siblings in the other room the four of them sleeping snuggled together and moving around the wash tub as if velcroed together. That night, there were only three eggs left, two of them with no signs of life. We carefully removed them from the incubator as if they were tiny bombs that still might go off, then waited for the last egg to hatch. But the peeping was faint 
and the hole that had been pecked out of one end seemed to get no bigger. Can't you do something? pleaded our neighbor, Marge, who was watching the movements of a tiny duck bill pushing weakly against the shell. Phil explained that a duck had to be strong enough to extricate himself from the egg in order to survive. It's nature's way, he explained. The book warns against help-outs, saying that such ducks should not be permitted to breed. But after March left, I continued to fret, not worrying at all about breeding, until Phil was persuaded to help nature along, using his steady and gentle hands to free this last duckling from its shell. The next morning, duck number five was alive and dry and ready to join his siblings. Whew, crisis passed. Now I can put exploding eggs into that category of bad things so well described by Mark Twain when he said, I've known a great many troubles in my life, but most of them never happened. These rescue ducklings won't know their mother but they seem to recognize our dog Ruby as a friendly protector. Ruby likes to put her head inside the wash tub, counting each duckling one by one. We don't give our ducklings names, but these five have numbers. Over to Phil for a grand finale. I'm going, to I'm going to close uh, by reading the, the poem that appeared in The Forester, and most of you have probably read it, but several people said that they would like to hear what it sounded like when I read it. And to tell the truth, I was thinking of it as a song when I wrote it, and I sort of hear it with kind of a Johnny Cash sound to it. So. Think Johnny Cash while you're listening to Back to the Future. I'm riding, sitting backwards on a forward moving train. I can't see where I'm going, but you won't hear me complain. My future hides behind me, but my past is plain to see. It lengthens as I journey, stretching out in front of me. I sit here in the present where my future turns to past. And while the future that's behind me is getting shorter really fast, the past before me stretches out further than I see, and my future just keeps dwindling down somewhere in back of me. The present's evanescent, no more lasting than a song. It's gone before you know it. You just have to move along. We strive, survive, and stay alive in momentary presence and wait to reach the ending of our lifelong, too brief sentence. When your future is behind you and your past is what's ahead, you will see things that you regret but can't see things to dread. When all you see has taken place, what's over and what's done, your future turns to past before you know it's even come. I'm traveling backwards to the future, looking forward at the past, doesn't matter which I'm facing, because this journey will not last. Whether barely getting started or getting near the end, my destination lies behind me, back around some bend. Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for coming, and we look forward to doing this again with people in the room. Y'all take care. Yes. <laughs>